Well, hi there, friends. Welcome to basically the first of the relaunch series of Net Squared Atlanta meetups. My name is Eli, and I'm the Net Squared Community Manager, which means I'm the cheerleader for the 120 similar groups in other cities who are hosting these kinds of tech for good meetups for the nonprofit community. This Net Squared program is actually a part of TechSoup, which is a nonprofit like yourselves that helps other nonprofits get and implement technology in their organizations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. As I said, this beast is global. So there are groups like this in Atlanta. Um, there's currently not one in New Haven. Um, so uh, if you're coming from a city where there isn't a local group, put something into the chat and I'd love to chat with you about bringing your own group in here. But you'll see in most major cities, except sadly, uh, you know, it looks like right now in South and Central America, you'll have less coverage. But we're there for you in most places. So welcome to this new community. And like every community, we have rules. Um, ours are, I think, reasonable and fair. So first of all, we welcome everyone. And secondly, we put community first, which means we're here to support each other. Third, we build stronger nonprofits. And so technology is, is the lens, the tool we use for these meetings, but ultimately it's about nonprofit organizational success and technology is just the nice way we get there. Fourth, most importantly, we invite participation. So we think everyone has something to contribute to these groups. And it also means that if you've got some brilliant idea or want to contribute to this group, maybe you want to be an event producer, maybe you want to take blog posts, make blog posts and do notes for these events, please reach out and the organizing team would love to put you to work. And then of course, finally, we treat each other with kindness and respect. There's an open chat window today, but before you put anything into that chat window, just ask yourself very quickly, am I bringing my kindest, most empathetic self to that chat? And if you are, chat away, we'd love to hear from you. As we said, we need your help and there's a number of different roles. Um, so uh, if you wanna get involved, please reach out to us. As promised, I'm gonna give you a quick tour of TechSoup. So as I said, a nonprofit that helps nonprofits get access to technology, that's hardware, that's software, that's services. We've partnered with about 120 of the major technology companies, everyone from Amazon Web Services, to Microsoft, to Google, to Zoom, the tool we're using right now. Um, and with these partners, we bring either totally free or deeply discounted services to nonprofits. Here's an example of what that could look like. So say you're a nonprofit with 10 staff. This is a bundle that would be quite commonly used. And this gives you a bit of a sense of the savings that you can get as a TechSoup member. And by the way, did we mention that TechSoup account is totally free, but only about half of US nonprofits currently have an account. So uh, if you're not sure, go to TechSoup.org and uh, start saving a bit of money. This brand new group has got some more events planned. As you see, there's one planned for April, another for August. Um, but again, if you've got a great event idea and want to do something in March, maybe you can you know, twist their arm a little bit into doing something fun with you. And now I wanna actually send it over to the local organizing team who are gonna be the public base and make sure this community thrives. So we've got Irene here and Matt, and we've also got a third organizer named Margaret who may show up a little bit later. Um, but with that, I wanna send it over to your local organizing team. Thank you so much, Eli. Um, I want to welcome everybody, and um, I hope Margaret does um, jump on because she's sort of the one responsible for getting me, myself, and Matt involved. I'm the executive director of the Cobb Collaborative, and we're the Georgia Family Connection Partner serving Cobb County. I dropped that in the chat um, pretty early on. That's a private public um, ecosystem throughout the state that's working to improve outcomes for children and families across our state. And so each county, and there's 159 counties in Georgia, has a partner. One of the things that we do in Cobb County is provide capacity building programs, services, and activities for nonprofits. So we'll host workshops on grant writing, 
um, program, how to design effective programs, measurement, that sort of thing. And so this is a nice alignment with what our current um, menu offering is, particularly as we have all since last March had to rely on technology to continue to engage our stakeholders, whether those are our board members, our clients, our volunteers, or, or what have you. So we're just delighted to be a part of this, and it just so happens to kind of restart the Atlanta chapter, which with Atlanta being the tech hub that it is, I think it's kind of sad that um, we had to do a reboot, but 2021 is the perfect time to do that. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Matt one time in person, I think it was a, almost a year ago, <laughs> and then we've connected at various times um, virtually since then. And Matt has a wonderful nonprofit in addition to his job that pays the bills and keeps the roof over his family's head that protects um, nonprofits from IT and risk management services. So Matt, hopefully you have dropped that in, in the chat as well. And so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Nikki Mellon, our presenter to the group. Mickey is the co-founder of Green Melon, which is a full service um, PR, media relations and technology firm. Um, full disclosure here, they host the Cobb Collaborative's website and help us. We received a grant from um, 48 and 48 um, about two years ago, I guess it was Nikki, maybe two and a half, time flies when you're in a pandemic, right? And they um, did a wonderful job, our tech did a wonderful job and got our revamped website to about the 90% um, of the way there. And then Mickey's team swooped in, they worked with our budget and our technology knowledge at the time and helped get us um, all the way there. And then they continued to guide us um, with uh, refresh and, and things that we, we need to do. So they are just wonderful partners to us and we couldn't do what we do in terms of engaging our community of 760,000 plus residents in Cobb without the support of Mickey and his team. So Matt, unless you wanna say anything, I'm just gonna let Mickey take it away. Go for it, Mickey. <laughs> All right, cool, thanks both of you. Um, let me share my screen here and we'll dig in. Pop up the chat. Cool. So, yeah, so thank you. Um, excited to be here and walk through this. Um, as I was thinking about what Irene had asked uh, for me to do here, I thought the easiest way might be just kind of walk through the process of building a new site. So, if you're looking at building a new site, you can see that process. But there's a lot of pieces along the way for your existing site. You can say, oh, we could tighten that piece up, we could work on that. So hopefully this will be pretty helpful regardless of where you are in the process. Um, for our team end to end, this is typically like a six month process to go through all these steps, but it really depends on you know, what pieces people need, what they don't. Um, if you have questions along the way, uh, do put them in the chat. Um, I like to take questions as we go. It's easier in context. If you have a question about something I'm talking about at the time, especially since I'll tend to go fairly quickly at times. Um, do slow me down and ask some questions. We'll, we'll jump in. Matt will be keeping an eye on that. And I'll, I'll keep an eye open too as best I can. Uh, so digging in, yeah, I mentioned our team. We're a team of seven. I don't have Robert in here yet, our new marketing manager, but we've been around like 11 years just off Marietta Square for any of you in the Atlanta area. And yeah, we build and manage websites and help with related marketing stuff. Um, so talking about processes though, before we dig into our process, uh, a couple of years ago, we were talking to a prospective client and we went through our process with him and he, he bailed out. He said, I can't do this. I don't want to be boxed in. And I can appreciate people wanting freedom, but wide open freedom can lead to easily prevented problems. So this process that we have allows for a ton of freedom at each step along the way, but with the steps themselves helping to keep things on the rails. So that's kind of how we approach this and we'll, we'll walk through it and again, we'll see how this works out here. So in starting a project, we kind of work through, you know, discovering, collecting assets and things of that nature. The goals are kind of the important part to see what people want from a website. And you should all be thinking about that too, because none of you need a website. A website, you know, isn't what you want. You want the things a website can do for you. So, you know, donations, getting volunteers, raising awareness, things like that. The website's a way to get you there. So that's that's the important part is figure out what the goals are so you can build, build it with that in mind. And the interesting thing, building a website with this kind of process is that design comes pretty far down the road. We're two or three months before we do any design. It's 
Um, reminds me of a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln says, give me six hours to chop down a tree. I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. And that's kind of our idea here is it's the website's going to be a graphical outcome. The end of the day is to produce graphics and stuff, but we spend a couple months before we even get to that. We spend you know, a few months sharpening things up and, and figuring out the message and going through that. And I'll walk you through those pieces um, as we go here. So the first place we start is messaging. And I imagine some of you have done this and some of you may have not. Uh, we generally follow a version of the story brand framework, which may be familiar to some of you, really to dig into who the audience is and how to talk to them. And the key is you want to tell the audience about their own problem so they know that you understand it um, the best you can. Then show them how you can overcome it and then show them what their life will be like when you're done. Um, there's a lot of story brand certified guides around the world you can hire. We are not one of those. We hire them from time to time. People can go to Nashville to take the course there for I think it's like 20 grand to take his course, but then you're certified and can lead it. And those people are amazing. So if you ever need help with story brand specifically, you can search for a guide, but the book itself will get you, get you a long way down the road for you know 10 bucks versus a whole lot more. Um, it's pretty great. And so that's kind of a good place to start is figure out that message. And again, the, the struggles you've been through before, the reasons you started your nonprofit or whatever your business is, if you can share those struggles you had in the day that can help really relate to folks. Um, Rory Vaden has a quote, it says you're powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. So if you can reach out to the people that are like in the shoes you were in before you got things started, before you figured out the solution you're working toward, they're the ones that you can empathize with the most and hopefully can serve the best as you go because they, they'll they yeah they'll relate to you the closest. Uh, Rory has a lot of good stuff out there too. Uh, so once you have the message figured out, uh, we move on to keyword research in a lot of places. You may or may not need it, but Ranking well in Google is an important thing for most all of us. Uh, we use a tool called Moz, but there's a lot of great choices out there. That's not necessarily the best. It's the one, the one we prefer. Um, and when figuring what keywords to go after, we go through a five-step process. So uh, this could be something useful. Again, if you have an existing site, you can kind of retrofit with keywords. Ideally, you do it before you start building, but you can always go back and make changes. That's the beauty of the web. Nothing is printed out and distributed in final um, like other things used to be. So our process we go through with Moz is you know, we build an initial list of, or we have the client build a list of 20 or 30 keywords they think they want to rank for. Just off the top of your head, what might be good to rank for? We then build that into a list of perhaps 200, looking at synonyms and other companies and other nonprofits and you know whatever we can come up with, just a glob of keywords that might work. Uh, we rank, uh, we have the client then rank each of those for relevancy, um, how well it matches what they do. When we come up with that glob of keywords, we're going to come up with some bad ones that don't really fit, and that's okay. So they can rank those. Then we do some pretty heavy research on those and then figure out where they should go on the site. And so the things that Moz helps us uncover, and again, other, other tools can as well. Um, you can see the spreadsheet we end up with, but that exploded view at the bottom there. We look at the volume of searches. How often do people search for these keywords? That's kind of an important one. The difficulty is how difficult will it be to rank for that. You know, There may be some great things you want to rank for, but it's just going to be too difficult because it's too broad of a word. Or there's too much com competition near you. The opportunity is a unique one that not a lot of tools have. And this is where Moz will look and say, okay, some searches you run, there's a there's four ads at the top and then there's a big map and then there's you know um, an image carousel below that. And the number one result is actually like two screens down. So even if you're number one, you're still kind of buried. The opportunity is not as good. So which keywords have better opportunities where if you rank high, you actually show up high literally on the page. And then the importance factor that the client gave us and Moz will kind of give us a score, a priority score on top of that. And then our team will actually dig in further and say, okay, their score is pretty good, but like in this first case, the information technology, the score that Moz said is pretty good, but we know that difficulty at 65 is still going to be too tough to do. So we go through then and look at it, but that tool helps helps get a long way. And then you can use these keywords throughout your site. We're not going to get into the, the technical SEO too much because that's a whole different animal, but really if you write content about the keywords, that's 99% of what you need, not 95%, you know, it's, it gets you a long way. If you just have the words on your page, that's what that's really what put Google into the picture, you know, 20 years ago was other ones had, you know, meta keywords and stuff you could hide behind the page. And Google said, what's on the site? What's really there? And that's one of the main things they look at. So if you just write about the words that matter, that'll get you a long way. Uh, but in the case of a new site, so we have the messaging and the keywords figured out. Uh, we work on navigation. We work on that site map, figuring out the navigation, um, including not just the pages in the navigation itself, but other pages that might be, you know, lower level than the navigation, but on the site. We want to figure out every page that needs to be created, uh, both from a copywriting and a design perspective, and just kind of figure out what they are and write a short description for each page, you know, a, a sentence or two on what's going to be on each page. So we have some idea. Because the next step, um, we, we really blow that up a bit more, 
and write a content outline for every page. And this gets this takes a little more time. Um, but you can see on the right some examples of content outlines, just a list of all the stuff that's going to need to go on a page. Every little element that needs to go on there, a subhead, a call to action, a search, maybe you have a video, maybe you have you know, some text on the side, maybe you pull in some reviews, um, all that kind of stuff. Figure out all the pieces that go on every page. Just kind of list them all out, um, including the goal for every page. We talked about goals earlier, but every page should have a goal. You know, the goal of a contact page or you know, an e-commerce page is pretty easy, you know, but there's other pages, there's still a goal. If someone reads this blog post of yours, what's the goal? You want them to click through that link there? You want them to contact you? What do you want to happen at the end? Because every page should have some goal to, to move forward to something else. And so think about what that is for every single page. And so once you have this piece done, you can start writing some of those pages. Uh, we will get into design in a moment. Um, someone asked, we can share a PDF copy of the presentation. Yes, well, I'll send that over to them and they will be sharing that out later too. Uh, so yeah, so you will get a copy of the presentation, so don't worry about that. Um, so as you get writing though, um, another quote I like to pull in uh, from Blaise Pascal says, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. You know, it takes time to be concise. And you've seen that on websites where people just say, I'm gonna write the about me page and it's you know stupid long and it's not worth reading. So as you, so that's okay to start there, then you have time, you should be kind of crunching it down and getting it more to the essence of what you wanna say. And the more time you spend, the better, keeping you know that messaging we talked about early in mind, how you wanna talk about yourself, and maybe some keywords on some of the pages, um, all that sort of thing. There's a study technique uh, called progressive summarization that Tiago Forte is big on. It's the same kind of idea where if you take notes on a book, you're gonna end up with a ton of notes, but kind of progressively work through and get it, you know, boil it down to really what matters. And if you can, if you can do that with the content on your site, that's always a good thing. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people are very verbose and it's, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't serve them well generally for website content pages where people have a relatively short attention span. Um, so as the content's being written, or perhaps after, depending on what's going on, we can get into a little bit of design now. We're finally getting to some, some visual stuff. Uh, we start with wireframes for a number of pages, blueprints, essentially, the page, a black and white outline. You know, so we have that content outline with a list of all the stuff on every page. And then we have some more things that we'd like to consider. We see on the left there, the search bar, maybe some breadcrumbs, maybe a call to action, some contact info, social icons, an email sign-up box, lots of different things. So between that and your content outline, you have a ton of stuff you want to fit on each page. And so it's easier to put it in here, just in black and white. You can sketch this on a napkin. It doesn't have to be any special tool. There's tons of great tools to let you draw this kind of stuff. But just figure out where things are going to go before you start designing. Um, I think it was Frank Lloyd Wright said, you know, with building homes, he said, it's easy, you can use an eraser on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. So the idea here is it's so much easier to add things in and move things around when it's just black and white boxes versus having a fully developed, built out site and then trying to move things around. Not that it's impossible, but it's a bit more of a sledgehammer, whereas here it's, it's pretty simple. So taking the time just to think through all your pages with those goals in mind, with your content outline, thinking what you want to do can yeah, save you a lot of time in the future. And again, this can work even if you have an existing site. If you want to add another page, think about it first before you just start building. Just take a few minutes, think what you want on the page. Would it make more sense for the video to be on top, on the bottom? Um, I see Irene asked, what are breadcrumbs? Yes, good question. I did glaze over that. I don't have a uh, visual example here, but it's the links at the top of the page that show you where you are on the site. Like it says home, about us, and our team, and navigation trails, uh, Brenji said. So yeah, just little links at the top that sometimes you want, sometimes you don't. You know, they can add a little clutter to a page, but they can make it easier for users. So it's, you know, it can be kind of good for SEO. So it's generally a good thing, but it also, again, it's one more thing to add some clutter to the page that may distract the user. So it's, yeah, situational. And I think it really depends how deep your site goes. If you have a lot of sections and subsections and subsections, it'd be useful for people to see how they can get back up the trail versus if you're relatively flat, it, it's not as important. So um, good question. And again, that's why we consider it in here and decide whether we're gonna, gonna do that or not. So we have some wireframes built. Now we can finally design. And so design is just taking those wireframes and making them you know, a, a design, design graphic. You know, in our case, it's still a flat graphic in Photoshop, whatever, you can kind of see how you know, some things change. We took the text here, made it centered, and this picture got a little bit bigger. But for the most part, it lines up. We're not rethinking at the design phase. How are we going to lay this out? We know the basic layout and then can, you know, take some, take some time to design things out there. And really, this kind of brings the one kind of downside to this process is design becomes a very anticlimactic step. It's not like the big, like, here it is, the big reveal. Like, it's already kind of known where you're getting to, which is a good thing, ultimately, I think. But there's not the big surprising reveal, which again, is good because there's no bad surprises either. People know what it's going to look like. They know the colors. It's, you know, it, it's anticlimactic, which is disappointing, but it's, uh, trust me, it's a good thing here. Um, so at this point, yeah, no move that bus. <laughs> not, not so much. 
Um, so at this point, you're going to start building the site, but a few things to remember sort of with design and with development, I kind of wedged it in between here, um, is accessibility. And that's becoming a much bigger thing as time goes on. So just some thoughts for keeping your site accessible for all users to be able to access it. Um, with themes, talking about WordPress themes specifically here, but any place you get a theme from, in general, themes should be dumb and pretty is what I like to say. I like to find great looking themes. They shouldn't do much. You should have the doing from plugins and other extensions so you can manage them separate. If a theme has a lot of baked in features that you can't remove, that's generally going to cause issues for a lot of things, but including accessibility. We're trying to unpack what's going on. Whereas if you have, say, a, a slide around your site or something that is not accessible, you can swap it out for a different one if it was a plugin, if it was an extension, but if it's kind of built into what you have and you're stuck with it, that's, that's not good. Um, when it comes to images, you can use alt, you should always use alt text on your images that just describes what the image is. So if someone can't see it, um, they can hear, you know, through their screen reader what that image was supposed to be. Just be descriptive of what the image is. Uh, that's also a big thing for search engine optimization. So people like to abuse that and stick a lot of keywords in, but that just makes life worse for your uh, readers or your visitors that have, have needs. So yeah, do try to be short and descriptive on what the images are. Uh, don't use pictures of text, use pictures of pictures and text of text. <laughs> if you need to put text on a picture, there's ways to do that with CSS. You can kind of layer things in. Uh, it's easy just to kind of drop the text in on the picture itself, but generally frowned upon. The next one people don't like well, but don't have links open in new tabs. You know, everyone likes to say when they click on this, I want it to open a new window so they stay in my site. But now you've kind of messed them up in a few ways, depending on you know certain, certain users. Um, an example I like to use is my mom, who's doesn't have any impairments per se, but if you open a new tab, she's going to try to hit the back button to go back to your site. That's not going to work anymore. She won't know why she's going to close it all, you know, versus, you know, you've, you've broken the back button, you've broken normal things. So it's very tempting to say when they go to my Facebook page, open it in a new tab, but you, accessibility wise, you really shouldn't do that. That is a, a ding they can easily detect. And if someone wants to come after you for, you know, for something, they can look at that. A minor thing to be sure, but a thing nonetheless. Accessibility, all this, I guess I really should say is there's no specific rules. There's guidelines, but it's all, it comes, a lot of it comes down to judgments. And so these are, you know, no one's going to say, ah, you had a link open a new window. That's three point deduction. And we can sue you now. You know, it's, it's softer than that. So just the more you can do, the better. Um, and then a few other things at the bottom here, your forms probably should be uglier than they often are with very verbose, like here's what the names of the fields are. You know, people like to do the faded text inside the field that says email, but it gets hard again if someone can't see there's you know going through the screen reader they can't tell what the fields are supposed to be so if there's a proper label it can read that label to them uh, use headings going down the screen of course that's always a good thing to do just for writing in general to break up your text but using proper proper bold headings and stuff throughout the page so people can jump as needed is good the accessibility statement's an interesting thing a lot of a lot of sites have this now at the bottom and it's really a CYA kind of thing to have an accessibility statement. You know, accessibility itself is you know about making sure users can see your content. That's the main idea of accessibility. Accessibility statements, though, are really to handle the second part, which is avoiding getting sued. You know, a lot of lawyers now are going out specifically to find websites that are not accessible so they can sue them. And you know, I've heard from lawyers that that's what they do. They literally go out to find them that are not accessible so they can sue them and you know make some business, which is not good. An accessibility statement doesn't protect you necessarily, but I think scares them off a bit. If they see three sites they might want to go after and one has a statement like these, these people have thought about accessibility at least so maybe they've done some more i'm not going to waste my time i'm going to go to this easier prey over here that's not considered this stuff and maybe easier to go after so if nothing else i think that's kind of the, the best thing there just to show you're thinking about this stuff and you're working on it and again no one's ever perfect but you're, you're trying your best um, on social media use camel case hashtags camel case meaning you know the capital letters inside the sentence if you do it all lowercase, a screen reader is going to try to read that as one long word, you know, and it doesn't, doesn't work well with most hashtags out there. If you use camel case, most screen readers will read it properly. They'll see the capitals as a new word and read as camel case versus camalcasy or whatever that might be if it was all lowercase. Um, and it doesn't mess up the effectiveness of hashtags. It still goes to the same hashtag as everyone else. And you'll see a lot of folks are doing this now anyhow. So just little things there. And then PDFs, um, I actually just added a few days ago to this presentation because in the UK, they've now passed guidelines, I think, I'm not sure the legality, that if you post a PDF, you need to have an accessible, quote, accessible version to go along with it. So that, that's going to be tricky for a lot of folks. Um, I'm, I've, I'm working on unpacking that myself on my blog. I'll share the link later. I'm posting about it tomorrow. I'm still trying to finish my thoughts there. But the idea is if you have a PDF, you need to have a separate version that people can actually read in HTML or some kind of accessible format, which is good advice anyhow. It's not to say PDFs are bad. 
Um, but it should be more of, here's this great piece. If you want to print it nicely, here's the PDF for it. But not, if you want to read what we have to say, here's the PDF. It should be, here's what we have to say. And if you want to print it, here's a PDF. And it's, it'll add more work. You know, PDFs have made people lazy, I think, to some degree. They can say, hey, I want to put this on the site. Just chuck the PDF up there and let people download it. And again, it works for 95% of your visitors, maybe more. But, you know, not for people that, that have issues because PDFs have a lot of shortcomings where, you know, screen readers often struggle with them. You can't increase font sizes easily. It's harder to move around. There's just a lot of a lot of bad things. They are great for printing. I mean, if you want someone to print something precisely, a PDF is phenomenal. So not saying don't use them, but just make sure uh, you have a good way to, to let them see your content. And then kind of a bonus with all this is we talk about ranking well in search engines. Pretty much all this stuff is going to help you rank better too. Having that alt text, having headings, you know, using a solid theme, not having the baked and stuff, this is all going to help you rank better in Google as well as make things more accessible. So it's kind of a win-win if you take the time to do it. And if you search for ADA accessibility testing or checking different words you can search for, there's a lot of tools out there that will scan your site and kind of give you an automated report on what they see. Um, and even those sites say, this is not comprehensive, please consult a professional, but you can at least see like, oh, it dinged us on these five things. Let's at least fix those five things or the four we can fix and the one that's baked in, we can't at least make things as good as we can. So anyhow, so we designed the site now and uh, with these sort of things in mind, we, we start building. In our case, we use WordPress, but again, it's not necessarily any better or worse than others. We like it for a lot of reasons, but you don't have to be there. Um, at the end of the day, they all spit out HTML for people to view and you know, it doesn't really matter what's behind it. Um, we like WordPress just because it tends to leave you in a better position for growth going forward with the ecosystem they have with other plugins and things. You know, if, if Irene came to us later and said, I really wanna be able to have you know, e-commerce on my site, we could add some e-commerce plugins and do that versus if you run a different platform, you may have to kind of bail and start over, which is not good, but um, that's up to you guys. Um, the, the piece here, and I can share this out as well, is when we launch, we tell folks launching a site is really a five minute thing. You know, it's just, you know, either copying the files over or changing where the domain points, but we have a huge checklist we go through to make sure things are perfect, make sure Google can see the site, make sure the forms work and all that kind of stuff. So I can share that checklist if any of you are launching a site soon, just that day off stuff can be so important because there's a few little gotchas that can, can really kill you. Uh, the one I see a lot is in WordPress, there's a checkbox that says discourage search engines from visiting this site, which when you're developing a site, that's good. You don't want Google to see it. But if you leave that on when you're live, Google will literally stop coming to your site and you won't show up anywhere. And it's so easy to miss that tiny checkbox. And it, it's brutal because you're not, you can't be found anywhere. So that's on our checklist, I think twice, just to make sure because we really don't want to leave that checked. It'd be very bad. Um, and Dallas has to share it. So yeah, I will, I'll find that checklist and, and get that shared as well. Of course, sadly, you're never ever done with the site. <laughs> never, never. Uh, so lots of ways to grow. You know, we, we train our clients on how to do it and we you know keep up with updates and monitoring and that kind of stuff. And you can always get into email marketing and social media and ongoing blogging and lots of different directions to go. I'm not gonna get too much into that because that varies so much depending on what you're doing and who your audience is. Um, but a, a quote I like to keep in mind with this kind of thing from Seth Godin, he says, the people you most want to engage with don't want to be hustled. Um, and I think with the election season just behind us, we saw what it looks like when people try to hustle you with you know, unsolicited text messages and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's what he's talking about here. Don't text, add people to a text message list without their authorization. Don't add them to your email list. I think that's more common. People say, ah, I have these 20 contacts. I'm going to put them on my email list. That's borderline illegal, depending on how you define illegal, but certainly unethical and things you shouldn't do. There's ways to do it the right way ways to build all your channels without resorting to cheap tactics. So, and really to Seth's point, you're not gonna gain many clients that way. They're just gonna be mad at you. You know, back to the election thing, how many of you got a text saying vote for so-and-so and said, oh, that's a great idea. Not, I hate them even more now, you know, because they're harassing me with these texts. So you'll come across the same way, I think with that sort of thing. And then the last little section to dig into here is tracking, you know, as you go forward, you wanna see what you're doing. So you can, you know, you can only, manage what you can measure. So lots of ways to track things. Four big ones we like to look at um, are Google Search Console. It's a free free tool from Google that you can log into. And it kind of show things, shows things from Google's perspective. It'll say, oh, your site looks okay. We see these pages. Here's some of the words you've come up for, you know, kind of from Google's eye in the sky perspective. And what's great about that is it can give you some great opportunities for if you're doing keyword research to try to rank better. Because you can see things, Google will say, oh, you're ranking generally about 20 seconds for this phrase. Say, huh. If I'm already 22nd, that's a lot easier to go from 22nd to second than it is from bland, brand new to second. So you can see some opportunities where you're ranking decently well for some things you weren't aware of. 
do a little more content around that and maybe rank even better. More importantly though, if Google sees a problem with your site, that's where they tell you about it. They're not gonna call you. If anyone calls you saying they're from Google, they're really from India. Uh, they're not from Google. Um, but Google will post things here. If they think you've been hacked or if they can't access some of your files or stuff, they're gonna post it to your Google Search Console account, whether you're there or not. So again, it's free and relatively easy to set up. Um, and it's good, if nothing else, just you can hear if Google thinks there's something wrong, you can then address that before it becomes a big problem. You know, If Google thinks you've been hacked, they'll let you know there. And then a few days later, they'll put the big red screen up for everyone else to know. So if you can get to it first, that's always a good thing. Um, Google Analytics, I suspect most of you use already just for tracking traffic on your site. I mean, main four categories they have now are for audience acquisition, behavior, and conversions. So audience meaning who came to the site, where did they come from, what kind of computer are they on, are they on a mobile device, just tell me about the people coming. Acquisition tells you where they came from, they came from that Facebook post, they came from a search, they came from a link on another site, you know, what happened, and then behavior and conversions dig into um, what did they do on the site? What pages did they look at? You know, what pages did they lead at? How many, which people filled out the form? You can set up all kinds of things in there. And I'll talk more about analytics in a little bit, but there's a lot you can get out of there. And again, that's another free tool. Um, almost all of you probably should have. It's worth having. And then the other two that we, we often do are heat maps to see where people click. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. And then a dashboard. There's different ways to set up dashboards because analytics is great for you know, nerds like me, but it can be overwhelming to try to just find a few key things if you need to from time to time. So there's ways to set up dashboards to say, hey, here's a quick look at some of the things that matter without having to dig in and, and click around and stuff. So for heat maps, uh, we use a tool called Fresh Marketer. Um, I think there's other ones like Crazy Egg and Hot Jar. They all have great names. Um, but basically it shows where, literally where people are clicking on your site. You know, analytics will tell you what pages they look at. This will show you a visual of where people are clicking. And it takes some time because ad blockers will block it and you know, cookies and stuff. You only get a handful out of you know, a dozen visitors that this works on. So you have to have a few thousand visitors to your site before you get much data in here. So it could take a few weeks, but it's still pretty valuable. Uh, a great example of how we use this, we built uh, the website for First uh, United Methodist Church Marietta three years ago. And when we were building the site, they said, we want our PDF bulletin on the homepage. And I was like, guys, it's 2017. No, you really don't. And they said, no, no, we do. We promise people want it. So, okay. We'll put it on there, you know, you, you know your audience better. So we put it on there, put the heat map on it as well. And that PDF bulletin glowed like the sun. People click that thing all the time. And so one, they were right. You know, I like to have the data to support my decisions and I didn't and they were right, so it happens. But also let us change things around a little bit too. Um, we kind of slid the PDF bulletin further down the page, kind of like putting the milk at the back of the grocery store to make people see all their events and all the stuff going on before they got to the bulletin that they were there for in the first place. So you can do some neat things with that. And really, this is more important to see what people are not clicking on. You know, if you have a big call to action and people are skipping it to go click on something else, you can look at rewording it, changing the color. You know, just think of, you know, at least you know what's going on. You can make some decisions from there. The, the results are different. And a lot of these will let you do what they call A-B testing as well. Um, I know Fresh Marketer does. I think Hotjar does. I'm not quite sure. Um, but it lets you say, hey, show half the people where it says, get my free offer and the other half where it says, try me now. And you know, just show different people and see which one attracts more clicks. And then after a while you say, okay, that one won. So let's go with that. Um, A-B testing can be tricky, but a few things like that make it pretty powerful and pretty easy. Uh, MailChimp, I know if any of you guys use MailChimp for your emails, they make it pretty easy too, where you can test out two different subject lines. Say, hey, MailChimp, send 10% of the people this subject line, send 10% this subject line, whichever one opens more, send that one to everyone else. And so. There's ways you can kind of test things and, and make yeah, make use of some data in almost real time with that. And this is a, a good example. And then for the dashboard example, uh, this is one called Databox, uh, D-A-T-A-B-O-X, all one word. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's very good. Uh, it's very easy. Google, Google has a product called Google, Google Data Studio, uh, which frankly I think is uh, free and more powerful. It's a, a better product in every way, but it's a lot more complex. It's it's very complex and you have to be kind of a designer to lay things out and figure out how you want. Databox, you say, hey, pull in some analytics here and pull in my MailChimp numbers here and it just kind of builds a little dashboard. So we do this for some of our clients where they'll say, hey, I wanna see, see how many people came to the site, how many people filled out the form and how much they spent in my store and how many people are on my email list. So we build a little dashboard that shows just those things in one screen and they can see it without having to log in analytics or get some PDF report or you know, do whatever they wanna do. So. Again, a lot of great tools for this as well. I'm not saying Databox is the best, but it's, it's for us, it's a great combination of powerful at a reasonable price. And it looks great without much effort on my end because I'm not the one to make things look great. <laughs> we have designers for that. I don't want to bug them with data. 
um, organizing. And what's neat with Databox too is it connects natively to, I don't know, a hundred different platforms. So you say, hey, just hit, hit a button to connect with your MailChimp, with your active campaign, with your Google Analytics, with your Facebook, with your Twitter, with your LinkedIn. It's all built in with the little icons. You just connect them up and they have some examples and you can make it run and, and does well. Data Studio connects to, again, more things, but it's more of a hassle to kind of get all of it working, but it's free. So if you have the time, that may be worth doing. And then my, kind of my closing thought here with all this stuff is, there's a lot of things in here. We try to do things the right way. Um, always want to do things as good we can, but uh, Voltaire said, the best is the enemy of the good. You know, I've seen too many people spend so long trying to make things picture perfect and never actually publishing. And that's, that's not good. You want to get things out there. Um, I actually just looked uh, yesterday to make sure this was still the case, and sadly it is, but we met with a gentleman about three years ago that had just a dreadful website. He had a new one someone had developed that was almost done, but he just couldn't, he wasn't happy with a few things with it, but it was so much better than what he had. Just wasn't quite happy with it. We offered some advice and it kind of fizzled out. And I looked yesterday, he still has his old site three years later because he hasn't quite made the new one perfect. And it's, we're not talking like a marginally better site. It's dreadful. Um, but he just, he wants it to be perfect before he launches. And as a result, he's got three more years of presumably lost clients and lost business. And so I'm not saying to hustle again, this is a six month process for us. We do it right, but you can always get too, too deep in the details and, and not actually get, get where you need to get. Um, I, I mentioned Seth Godin earlier. I follow a lot of his stuff. He's big on just get it out there, man. You know, just publish. If it's better than what you have, publish and move on and keep iterating and keep making it better. And I encourage you to do the same. So uh, that's all I have. Uh, certainly have time for more questions if you want. Uh, you can find me, you can find our company at greenmelon.com. Careful how you spell melon. Uh, very specific on that. I'm at Micmel. I have a handful of courses in there. Um, I have one about setting up a blog, kind of a, I call it a technical uh, course for non-technical people. So if you want to set up the right way, I can use a code nonprofit web uh, to get half off that. And then we have a meetup uh, that we run as well. I mentioned it because uh, this, this month on the 21st is all about Google Analytics. So if Google Analytics has a new one called uh, Google Analytics 4.0, which is wildly different. Um, and frankly, part of the reason I'm doing it at our meetup is because I don't fully understand the new one yet. And so by teaching it, I'm going to have to teach myself to be able to teach it. So I'm digging into that. And so that should be worth worth looking at. So um, it's, a, it's an online meetup like all everyone else is now. So you're all certainly welcome to attend there. So that's what I've got. And yeah, happy to answer any other questions or thoughts from there. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Nikki. You're welcome. Um, Eli, oh, Matt has, Matt's commenting that as soon as he hangs up here, I guess he's going to make some changes. <laughs> um, Eli, with this being our first time, do you invite people to unmute if they have a question or just continue to drop in the chat? Well, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we can do whatever we'd like to do. Please, um, we have a couple more minutes. If anybody um, has questions or comments for Nikki, um, please. Oh, Elon um, needs to be added as a co-host. He says. Yeah, I see that. Um, please go ahead and. Um, drop those in the chat or you are more than welcome to un unmute yourself and, and ask. And I'll cover a lot awfully quickly, but yeah, and I will share the slides and the checklist um, afterward. Eli will post that out in the next couple of days. Lovely. I lost all my permissions, but I'm back. And so, yeah, yeah I just also gave people the ability to take themselves off mute, so you'll now oh, cool. have that ability, which you didn't before. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> Big brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't be shy after we went through all of that. Um, so, Nikki, I think um, I see Elena has one here. Okay, great. Hi. My name is Elena. I volunteer and work for a nonprofit in music education, and we serve primarily Spanish speaking students and families, though we are based here in Columbus, Georgia. So our first website was all in English and the person who volunteers to do web design for us made a connecting website that's also in Spanish, but I'm wondering if you would have any suggestions on how to 
efficiently build a bilingual website that is correct and high quality in both languages, not just using like translate on every page? Right. Good question. Um, one we use in WordPress is called WPML, WordPress Multilingual. And it lets you on every page, you basically have two editors or three, however many languages you have. You type the English version here and the Spanish version here. For every page, you kind of go through and do that. So if people switch the translation on the site, it doesn't actually change the address of the site. It just shows the entire site in their language with the words you used to translate it. Um, there's other tools that will do kind of an automatic translation like you talked about, but th that's probably the easiest. I think it may be free or it's certainly under a hundred bucks. It's not, not expensive um, and gives you the way to do that yourself if you have a person that can do a proper translation for you. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I saw in the chat, Joe asked if we're strictly a WordPress shop and we are at this point. Um, I'm always trying out new tools and seeing what's new. I suspect, I'm sure at some point we won't be, you know, strictly WordPress, but I think they're just about to hit 40% of the entire internet now. So I don't see that changing anytime real soon. It's a huge percentage. And WordPress is interesting. I love the community around it. The community is kind of like this, where everyone just kind of, you know, shares their ideas and thoughts and gives away all their secrets to each other and they all give it back and it's, it's beautiful. Uh, the advantage of that community though, is there's thousands of people literally helping to develop WordPress all the time, make it better and to add plugins and to, um, you know, free, free plugins and paid plugins and themes. And it's just so easy with that ecosystem around it to, to build things. Uh, Joomla, you mentioned, I have not used. I like it in general. Again, I like open source software that, you know, again, people can contribute to and share and, and use. You're not stuck somewhere. Um, that's kind of kind of my issue with Squarespace and nothing against Squarespace. It's a great platform. If you build your site there, it's not bad, but you're stuck. Like if their server gets slow or if they don't like you anymore, or if they don't have a feature, you're out of luck. Like you, if you want to move somewhere else, you have to start from scratch elsewhere. With WordPress, if you're on a host that's too slow or they don't like you or whatever, you can move your site somewhere else relatively easily. And same with Joomla and that kind of stuff. So I like, I like keeping my options open uh, to make things best. And that's part of the reason we're still there. Um, okay, Irene, you could have just said it, but yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts on budgeting for hosting, plugins, et cetera? Hosting, I like to, the, my favorite host lately is uh, one called Flywheel. There's certainly lots of good hosts out there. I would encourage you not to spend $1.95 a month on hosting. You know, Flywheel is 15 bucks a month, which is a whole lot more than others, but it's 15 bucks a month to make sure you have a fast, you know, reliable site. I think it's worth that. Certainly other good ones out there. WP Engine, who actually bought them, but a little more expensive, but a good one. Lots of good hosts. But I would say plan to spend 15, 20 bucks a month on hosting at least just to get a decent host out there. And then plugins is so hard to say what to budget for that. You know, most of what we have on a site is free. Um, other than perhaps some backup plugins and stuff. But yeah, I, I'd say maybe if you have a lot going on, maybe a hundred bucks a year just to buy if you want a better form plugin or different things. But it's that that's a trickier one to say. I mean, even hosting is really, if you have a lot of traffic, certainly that changes the game. But if you're under a couple hundred visits a day, the, the cheapest flywheel plan should be fine. And that's that's where I would go. But certainly, again, there's a thousand house, hosts out there and um, at least a few dozen that are pretty good. So <laughs> yeah, they're not the only ones. Okay, Paula asking, regards to ADA guidelines, what are best practices for hearing impaired site visitors and video content? Uh, and video content, okay, gotcha. So yeah, having a, a transcription of your video is kind of the key there. And there's a few ways to do that. One is to transcribe the entire video like as your post. I've done that with some of our podcasts in the past where we post the podcast and then full transcription of it below. And then on top of that, you should also go to, YouTube will do the automatic transcription, but you should fix that yourself and get a proper transcription there for YouTube or Vimeo, wherever you host, you can upload your own transcription and kind of match it up to make sure it's perfect. So yeah, just to make sure they get, they can see that, you know, closed caption as they're watching the video, but that's, that's certainly a big one to fix and can be a tricky one for a lot of folks to make compliant, you know, if they don't have that. You know, a lot of these things like adding alt text to images and stuff is really pretty easy, but videos can be tricky for, for vision impaired users. And that's, yeah, that's kind of your best bet is to have that transcription so they can um, again, I said read it, but really so it can be read to them by their player or if they're not listening. Yeah, it kind of depends. There's so many different situations, you know. In our case, if someone was vision impaired, they could probably just listen to the video and get most of it. But does that have the content? You know, they may, you may need more descriptive text in the um, transcription. So yeah, just try, try to put yourself in their shoes is your best bet for a lot of that. See what would make the most sense and help them do it if they weren't able to see this content or hear the content or whatever the case may be. So we probably have time for another question or two before we wrap up, if anybody has anything.
everybody's anxious to get to their blogs and start checking everything, I think, Mickey. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. <laughs> Um, Eli, do you want to give a teaser about our April meeting? Well, I'll admit I'm no expert about the April meeting, but what I would love to say is uh, I'm super excited that this group has come back. Um, thank you, Mickey, for, for being the initial expert. Um, and to Matt and Irene and Margaret for stepping up to lead a community because community doesn't happen by accident. It happens because a trio of people say this must exist in the world. So I'm super grateful to the three of you for stepping up to make this role happen. Um, and to the rest of you, if you've got clever ideas, again, don't be shy. Let us know what you want. If there are topics that you think need to be part of the mix here, let us know. And if you have a guest speaker in mind, even better, of course. Um, Mickey, did you see the questions about discounts or Eli for nonprofit sites such as PayPal, etc.? Um, I can you can prove that you're a nonprofit for PayPal and um, qualify for reduced transaction fees. But Mickey and Eli and Matt, if you want to weigh in on other things, I, I don't know. I think most plugins probably not, just because they're one man shops, just trying to collect their money. They don't deal with that hosting sometimes, but I don't know details for sure. I, I can't say. I know some do, I know some don't, I just don't know which, which offhand, so. Yeah, and I think my recommendation there is you would be shocked if you basically search for the company you're about to sign a deal with and put the name, the word nonprofit in there as well. You would find that there are 50% discounts for all kinds of interesting things, including like, you know, WordPress forms. Um, if you dig in, you'll find all kinds of interesting discounts for you as a nonprofit. And of course, don't be shy about asking. Um, and Eli, somebody asked about if there is a group email or um, did you see, does this group have an email group? So the group does not currently have a mailing list where people can communicate. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea and I would encourage the organizing team to think through whether that's something they have the energy to maintain and steward, of course. But I think that's a lovely suggestion. So thank you, Dallas, for that. Um, and if the team gets ambitious, they'll definitely let you know and they'll message all the meetup members. You know what happens when people have good ideas, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Dallas, you may be voluntold. Careful. <laughs> like your board member that has a great idea for a fundraiser. Awesome. <laughs> Um, well, I do want to invite everybody to our next scheduled meeting, which is in April, April 13th. Um, we've tried to keep these consistent on a Tuesday at noon, and that's going to be about using technology to do fundraising and capacity building. And we have a, a great speaker, Amy Crowell, who has uh, written a book about fundraising A to Z. She's really an expert. And I think Matt has already dropped the information in um, the, the group or Eli has about Amy and her track record that she brings in terms of nonprofit and um, fundraising and development. I can tell you she hosted a lunch and learn last June for the collaborative on virtual fundraisers, which is um, pretty much early summer is when everybody realized that other than maybe a golf tournament in late fall, all the luncheons and the galas and the silent auctions and all of that when we, we used to just pack hundreds of people into spaces for our biggest fundraisers of the year um, were not going to happen at all in 2020. And Amy led us all through a great conversation on how to hold virtual casino nights and fundraise um, galas and 5Ks and that sort of thing. And she'll take that and expound upon it for our April meeting. But as Eli has been encouraging you, if um, you do have ideas, I have dropped my email address in the chat and I think Matt has a couple of times as well. Please let us know. Um, we're just two people and we also have full-time jobs. So we welcome the opportunity to collaborate and share names and, uh, and resources. 
not only here for our neighbors in Metro Atlanta, but obviously, um, you know, if it's if it is one benefit that the pandemic has caused is that we've been able to connect with friends far and wide, right? And we can all benefit from this information. So um, Matt, Eli, I'll let you gentlemen close us out. That's right, Matt. Say that you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you actually are throwing it over to me, uh, thank you very much, Mickey, for the awesome presentation. I literally have a notepad here of five different categories of things to go fix. And I'll be swiveling around in about 10 seconds to do that. So thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Fabulous. And then with that, let's wrap this up again. So grateful to our guest expert, Mickey, who let, gave all this knowledge and uh, and to our hosts who, as as they said, like, you know, generously gave of their time to make this actually happen and keep in touch because they have schemed up several great new plans for the rest of the year. Otherwise, have a great day and uh, enjoy your lunch. Cool. See you. Thank you. Thank you so much.